Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Rest in Christ. This is lesson number 10 in that series entitled Sabbath Rest. It's the lesson for September 4 of uh, 2021, and as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, once again, we turn to your word to indulge ourselves, to learn of the truths that are hidden there and, and some not so hidden. Help us to realize what you want us to know from this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been told by someone that you were trying to influence to join the church that the Sabbath, uh, it's been changed? Uh, here's a comment that from our Bible study guide, just commenting on that. Jim? We hear all sorts of arguments against keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, don't we? We hear that Jesus changed the Sabbath in, to Sunday, or that Jesus abolished the Sabbath, or that Paul did, or that the apostles replaced the Seventh-day Sabbath with Sunday in honor of the resurrection, and so forth. In recent years, some of the arguments have become more sophisticated, claiming, for instance, that Jesus is our Sabbath rest, and therefore we don't need to keep that day or any other any day holy. And of course, there will always be the argument, strange as it is, that by resting on the seventh day, we are somehow seeking to work our way to heaven. From the Working our, resting to work our way, huh? That's an interesting. <laughs> so how are we supposed to respond to those arguments? Is it possible that just one of the Ten Commandments has been changed or dropped out? Could it be that, I re that by refraining from work on the Sabbath, resting as God did at the end of creation week, we are trying to work our way to heaven? Does keeping the fifth or sixth or first or any other commandment mean that we are working our way to heaven? Or is it just a good idea to keep those commandments? Unfortunately, many of our Christian friends have come to believe that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are only not myth. Uh, by that, they don't mean that they are completely false, just that they were given to teach some important lessons, but they're not really based on fact. In creation, God had a lot of things to think about. Imagine all the different chemical processes, biological processes, and interactions that must take place to keep us alive every second of our lives. Each of those processes is controlled by DNA and protein, mo protein molecules that reside in specific locations within cells. One of my favorite quotations from Ellen White, she wrote many, many years ago, of course, she said it like this, talking about those intimate chemical processes that keep us alive. She says, every beat of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. I love that. It's not literal, but the point is those, those chemicals wouldn't work. Those cells wouldn't work if God was not there and, or not, had not set up the organisms and made everything work. Because of sin over time, those things stop working. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yes. Charles, you want to take us to Genesis 1? 26 and 27. Then God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. Okay, can I interrupt for a yes, second? Sir. Every time I read that verse, I ask, okay, how are we supposed to be, have dominion over the fish? Eat them. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not what God intended. Uh, how do we know? <laughs> he didn't intend for us to eat fish. Obviously, in Genesis 1, 29, he says that he gave you the veggies to eat and yeah. so forth, which is what, the, a verse or two later. Yeah. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Um, I, have, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, what is the original word dominion? Uh, That's a good question. I haven't looked you, that one up. You know, you know Hebrew, so. No, I don't. I know very little about Hebrew. 
Um, hold on just a second. I will see if we can if we can call it up real easy. Uh, it doesn't look like my my computer's not doing it right now. But you know that word could make a big difference in our understanding of the word yeah. dominion. Good. So, God created us male and female. It says. Evolutionists suggest that since there's so much DNA which is similar between human beings and even some plants, that this is proof of the evolutionary process. Um, I don't know if you looked at, I haven't looked at those stats recently, but it's something like 30 or 40 percent of our DNA, I think, is, is duplicated even in a corn plant. Watermelon. Um, probably something yes. like that. Uh, by contrast, wouldn't it also be correct to say that God, if God had figured out a way to code some chemical process that is necessary for life, why not use it repeatedly in different organisms? I mean, you don't have to say that that's evolution. There are ways, there are way too many differences between us and even the most advanced apes for us to believe that we came from them or even from their ancestors. Myra? Oh. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. They were to live in close communion with heaven, receiving power from the source of all power. Upheld by God, they were to live sinless lives. Ellen G. White, Review and Herald. Okay, so if human beings were a new and distinct order, and the next sentence says they were made in the image of God and it was a Creator's design that they should populate the earth, does that mean we are the only other creatures in the universe that are able to procreate? It seems like... I, I see some gears turning. <laughs> I like what uh, uh, Richard Nee yeah. said years ago. He says, when God wanted to make a billion angels, he made a billion angels. Yeah. When he wanted two humans, he no, made wanted, two of them. When he wanted to make a billion humans. He, yeah, he made two of them. He made two of them, yeah. So okay. The animals obviously can procreate. So I thought that through quite a bit and back and forth. And I think, you know, I suspect God did this, did this because he knew sin was coming. And he couldn't come down to this earth and pro I mean, and create beings and so forth, and then let Satan try to convince them to sin each one, having been just created from God. He realized what was coming, and he, he made all of us on this earth able to procreate in one way or another, be so that we could self-perpetuate, and and uh, things could happen without uh, God's, you know, personal, obvious intervention. Well, what should be our relationship to the rest of creation? Think about how animals and birds and fish and plants were created in contrast to how God created Adam and Eve. What did God mean when he said we should have dominion over creation? So the Good News Bible says power over. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Surely sin has marred creation, yes? Just, I have a... a Definitions here: so subjugate, mm -hmm. uh, to prevail against, reign over, um, and so forth. Dominion. To take, Dominion. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, surely, sin is my, as we have suggested in the past. Creation is a memorial, of more than just creation. So the Sabbath is more than yeah. just a memorial of creation. Yeah, I see that. I'm sorry. The Sabbath is a memorial. Last week we reviewed Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15, which says, Gordon? Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. Okay, so here's the challenge 
with looking at that verse. And if you read, read on another few verses, it says, and these are the commands that I gave you, God speaking. So the, the question is, is this a replacement for Exodus 20, or is it an addition to Exodus 20? Yes. There's no reason why it needs to re replace Exodus 20. Uh, it can be addition. And it can be an addition to Exodus 20. God is so adding. God created and he recreated them. He gave them new lives from slavery. Mm -hmm. Gave them the ability to think and do for themselves. Yeah. The children of Israel had just come out of slavery. When they arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai, and, and by the way, some of us know that our government has just created a new holiday mm -hmm. that celebrates the idea that some people came out of slavery. We think of them as being quite primitive and uneducated, but are there ways in which we are enslaved ourselves? Well, what about these verses? Genesis 4, 7, if you had done the right thing, you would be smiling, but because you have done evil, sin is crouching at the door. It wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. And who is that verse talking about? Cain. Cain. Hebrews 12, verse 1, Actually, I think is if you go down a little bit farther there, it says do it just if you are right. You, yeah. In other words, if you're right, it isn't what you do, it's how you think. Yeah. In fact, it, it doesn't say anything that we people get it. Well, what was it wrong with this offering? It has nothing to do. It's just yeah. the way Cain was thinking is what, what, what his problem was. Okay, Hebrews 12, 1. As for us, we have the, this large crowd of witnesses around us, and you remember that in the original, there, this was a continuous document. There were no chapters and no verses, but in the section we call Hebrews 11, it's the whole list of the saints, the great champions of faith down through this. And so now he's saying at the beginning of chapter 12, as for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us, starting with, with Abraham and right down to, I don't know who's the, the latest in that whole sequence, but a lot of people. So then let us rid ourselves of everything that gets us gets in the way and of the sin which holds onto us so tightly and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Sin holds onto us so tightly. Does that mean that we are enslaved to it? Well, you're enslaved to who your, your master is. It becomes yeah. your master, <clears throat> doesn't it? And 2 Peter 2, 19, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. For a person is a slave of anything that has conquered him. Is it possible that sin could control us? How could we escape the slavery of sin? The firstborn sons of the children of Israel were preserved by splashing blood over the doorpost on Passover night. Could we be saved by the blood of another lamb? Notice the capital L. What does it mean to be saved by the blood of the Lamb? And what does it have to do with the Sabbath? Jesus took upon himself the results of sin. He died on our behalf in order to demonstrate the serious consequences of sin. But three days later, exercising his own divine power, he arose from the tomb and returned to heaven. I was listening to a sermon this morning by a friend of mine and he said it was the human Jesus that died, but it was the divine, divine Jesus that rose. And that would, of course, be true. Baptism is supposed to represent that process, dying to the old man, rising to a new life. God will do anything he possibly can without violating our freedom. He refuses to violate our freedom to free us from the slavery of sin. And how does God actually change us and free us from sin, Jim? Throughout the parable of the sower, Christ represented the different results of the sowing as depending upon the soil. In every case, the sower and the seed are the same. Thus he teaches that if the word of God falls, excuse me, fails of accomplishing its work in our hearts and lives, the reason is to be found in ourselves. But the result is not a beyond our control. True, we cannot change ourselves, but the power of choice is ours and it rests with us to determine what we will become. Wait, since it's um, highlighted there or 
heavy letters. Um, it appears that the rest of the Christian Christendom, other than some Adventists, believe that once you give your heart to the Lord, even He Himself cannot undo it. Yeah. Yeah, but that's what a lot of people believe. No, I'm I've been saved. Yeah, yeah. Some. I mean, you read books and it's there. Mm -hmm. Once you're saved, you cannot be unsaved. Of course, there are also those who call, are called universalists who believe that everyone will be okay. saved. Okay. Are there people who believe that God made the decision about who should be saved way before any of us were born? You just predestined, predestined to Calvinist. be saved. Calvinists, right, right. Well, go ahead. The wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground hearers need not remain such. The Spirit of God is ever seeking to break the spell of infatuation that holds men absorbed in worldly things and to awaken the desire for this imperishable treasure. It is by resisting the Spirit that men become inattentive to or, neg neglect, excuse me, or neglectful of God's Word. They are themselves responsible for the hardness of heart that prevents the good seed from taking root for the evil growth excuse me, for the evil growths that check its development. Ellen White, Christ's, ob Christ's object, object Lessons, page 56. Where do you think you would fit in the parable of the sower? Stony ground? Good ground? Thorny ground? Seed snatched away by the birds? Hmm. One of the questions that have, has been raised repeatedly about the Sabbath is whether or not it was only for the Jews. We have already said very clearly that the Sabbath was created at the beginning for all mankind. I hope nobody would be so foolish as to say that Adam and Eve were Jews. But what, and by the way, it's interesting that another little tidbit from, from Hebrew, the word Adam means mankind. So at that point in time, one person was all of mankind <laughs> for a short time. But what other evidence do we have to suggest that while the Jews may have been the recipients of God's messages, they were for all mankind? Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine but you will be my chosen people, a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. Why do you think God placed Israel in, pa in Palestine at the crossroads between three continents, where people from each of those continents would need to pass through on their business? Well, look, go ahead. Look at Exodus 3rd 23, 12. Go ahead, Amara. Work six days a week, but do not work on the seventh day, so that your slaves and the foreigners who work for you, and even your animals, can rest. Good news, Bob. Okay. So even the foreigners who work for you, I hope they weren't put there in Palestine just so they could uh, get foreigners to work for them, but yes, there were some who did. In this passage, God says that foreigners and even animals are supposed to rest when? On the Sabbath. Okay. Who is not included in the, that group? Surely these statements from the Bible suggest that every human being should be eligible to experience the Sabbath. So what does God, what does Sabbath keeping mean to you? Is it a time to, of joy and even service toward others? In the New Testament, in the times of Jesus, um, the religious leaders had formulated hundreds of rules for Sabbath keeping. Try to imagine how this might have come about. For most of the people in the world in those days, the Sabbath was either unknown completely or totally disregarded. But then Satan had to try to figure out what to do with the Jewish people who uh, were committed to Sabbath keeping. I mean, you can't leave a whole group of people just because they're trying to keep the Sabbath. Satan, from Satan's perspective, just not tempt them, not, not try to mess things up for them. Why not? Satan speaking, why not take them into the ditch on the other side of the road and make it virtually impossible to keep the Sabbath? Notice these guidelines taken from the Jewish Mishnah. 
Some of you are familiar with the Mishnah. The main classes of work are 40 save one. Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, cleansing crops, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing wool, washing or beating or dyeing it, spinning, weaving, making two loops, weaving two threads, separating two threads, tying a knot, loosening a knot, sewing two stitches, Okay. Tearing, uh, tearing in order to sew two stitches, hunting a gazelle, slaughtering or flaying or salting it or curing its skin, scraping it or cutting it up, writing two letters, erasing in order to write two letters, building, pulling down, building a fire, putting out a fire, lighting a fire, striking with a hammer and taking out aught from one dominion into another. Domain domain into another. These are the main classes of work, 40 save one, from the Mishnah, okay. page 106. I will tell you how this is still implemented in conservative Jewish places. Uh, we were on a tour of Israel with a group, and we, they put us up in a nice hotel in Jerusalem for a couple of nights while we were there. And one of those nights, one of those days, one of those nights was Friday night onto the Sabbath. And in, it, they had a very nice system. I wish other countries would adopt it. System of four elevators, toot, 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 across like this. And you came in and it just, you push, just push the button and it says elevator three, elevator one. It would tell you which elevator was coming first. And you'd get on and away you go. Beautiful, very nice. But then on Sabbath, all of a sudden we discovered it didn't work quite like that. There were two elevators that worked like that. Those are, those are for us Gentiles. But the other two elevators, since pushing that button sent an electrical signal and was considered to be the same as lighting a fire. Or work, juice, huh? work in other words. Yeah, you couldn't do that. So elevator number three went to all the even floors. One, three, five, seven, it stopped. You, nobody had to push a button. It just automatically went straight up, straight down, straight up, straight down, missing, going to all the odd floors. Elevator number four went to all even floors. So you didn't have to push any buttons to get to your floor if you were a conservative Jew. They probably turned the power on and the computer on for that to, on, on Friday afternoon. Yeah. And didn't turn it off till after sundown on Saturday. Probably. Uh, talk about ridiculous. That Could it is. be that it all started uh, shortly after Nehemiah, uh, the rebuilding of the temple? Well, down to the... I mean, and they added more and more. Yeah, this is what happens, and 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 new scholars coming along, they want to add their two bits to it, and so they add something more. I mean, we're doing that today. Every scholar wants to get his PhD, and so what do you got to do? You got to investigate something, or you got to add something to the literature. Yeah. Well, in the footnote, it goes on. If I know what it says, these 39 acts of work are treated in various degrees of detail in chapters 11 and following. So we better go check out chapter 11 and following, right? So what are those details? What if you were rushing home on Friday evening and you did not quite make it home and your donkey was still heavily loaded? There's a definitely a rule for that. Gordon, let's, let, me, let me jump back to you. What's, what, what do you do on Friday evening? Well, you can't continue to, to carry money or anything. So no. let me read from the Mishnah. If on the eve of the Sabbath, darkness overtook a man while he was on the way, he must give his purse to a Gentile. Of course, that would be while it was still Today. Friday night. Right. Friday before well, sunset. Yeah, down. Friday, yeah. And what was the reason for that? The Gentiles couldn't be saved anyway, so it's all right if they, they violate the Sabbath. Okay. And if there was no Gentile with him, he must put it on the ass or on the donkey. When he has reached the outermost courtyard of the town, he may take it off from the, from the donkey. Such baggage as can be taken off on the Sabbath. And for what cannot be taken off on the Sabbath, he may loosen the cords so that the sack may fall down of themselves. So that you're not killing your donkey by having him sta standing there with being loaded, fully loaded, all the, all the entire Sabbath day. 
but yet you can get your stuff down. Well, you just can't carry it. Right. Well, you there's certain things. If you don't move, and it'll just fall off. And, Listen and, to chords. Yeah, and, but there are certain things that you're allowed to carry. Uh, there are special rules for very, very, very minimal yes. items. Yeah, exactly. Remember that Jews were not allowed to light or put out a fire on the Sabbath. But what if a Gentile was willing to light the fire for him? Are you old enough to put out the fire? Okay, another rule. Gordon? If a Gentile come, if a Gentile came to put out the fire, they may not say to him, put it out, or do not put it out, since they are not answerable for his keeping Sabbath. But if it was a minor, that is a young person, a young person that came to put it out, they may not permit him, since they are answerable for his keeping Sabbath. So you can't even tell the young person that's a Gentile, please put out the fire, because if he's the young person, and therefore you're responsible for what, what he does when you tell him to do it. So you're causing him to break the Sabbath. Okay? Serious stuff. Yeah. One of the most unusual rules is about bathing on the Sabbath and drying off after bathing. If a man bathed in the water of a cave or in the water of, the Tiber of Tiberias and dried himself, even though it was with ten towels, he may not bring them away in his hand. From the okay. Mishnah. Well, you might wonder, why, I mean, what would that mean? So there's a footnote. From fear of offending against the principle of squeezing out however little the moisture in them. So in okay. other words, as you're carrying one of these ten towels, or one of the ten towels, you might possibly squeeze the towel, which is ringing, which is a yeah. sin. Okay. Do you suppose that God intended for us to be following some of these rules even today? I should say that um, the, some people went on to speculate about this. It's all right if ten men go and bathe and at the same time, and they all use the same towel. Now you can imagine what that towel would look like by the time 10 men had dried on it. But it was safe to take it home because the other nine men could keep warning the one who's carrying the towel not to squeeze it. <laughs> so, those are the rules. Rules are rules. Do you suppose that God intended for us to be following some of these rules even today? Very conservative Jews are still trying to follow some of them. Some of the most important miracles that Jesus performed in the Bible happened on, oh dear, the Sabbath? Sabbath? Yep. John 5, 7, and 7 through 18. The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one, and this is a story that's familiar to many of you, of Jesus coming and uh, uh, going to this pool that was very close to the temple, and people are gathered around. In fact, you can, you can go and you can see it. I don't know if you can still go down there. I went down there when I was, the first time I visited, visited Jerusalem in 19, when was that? 1970, I guess. Um, was not allowed to go down there, but the stairs are very steep. I don't think they let people go down there anymore, but you can take pictures of it. It's quite a ways underground now because people have kept piling, you know, stuff on top there and building above it and so forth like that. So this is a story of Jesus coming to that uh, pool and healing a sick man. The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one here to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. While I am trying to get in, somebody else gets there first. Now, I don't know how this got started, but a rumor had got started, an idea got started, in, discussed in John 5, uh, that at certain times an angel would come down from heaven who he would stir the water a little bit and if you were the first person into the water after the angel stirred it you would be healed no matter what your problem was well you can imagine a guy who was seriously crippled I mean he's never going to who are the first ones it's always going to be the, the psychiatric patients that are just sitting whoop, and they're in just like that and there's no way the crippled man is going to be in before them so It sounded like a very arbitrary rule. Yes. yes. So the man says, I, I'm always, they always get ahead of me. I'm trying to get in. Somebody else gets there first. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Immediately the man got well. 
he picked up his mat and started walking. The day this happened was a Sabbath. So the Jewish authorities told the man who had been healed, this is a Sabbath, and it's against our law for you to carry your mat. He answered, the man who made me well told me to pick up my mat and walk. Now, I always smile every time I come to that part of the story because how many people do you think were walking around Jerusalem that could pick a man <laughs> who'd been crippled for 38 years and say, pick up your mat and walk and you just jump up and away you go. Yeah. They knew perfectly well. There's no question about who had done it. But the man who had been healed did not know who Jesus was for there was a crowd in that place and Jesus had slipped away. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said, listen, you're well now. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Then the man left and told the Jewish authorities that it was Jesus who had healed him. So they began to persecute Jesus because he had done this healing on a Sabbath. Jesus answered them, My father was always working, and I too must work. This saying made the Jewish authorities all the more determined to kill him. Not only had he broken the Sabbath law, but he had said that God was his own father, and in this way had made himself equal with God. Whoa, that's serious stuff. Well, a careful study of the events in the four Gospels suggests that this story took place during the second Passover that Jesus attended during his ministry. And if you read carefully, and you put all those four Gospels together chronologically, there were four Passovers during the ministry of Jesus. And of course, during the last one uh, was a time when he was arrested and killed. During the first Passover, six, about six months after his baptism, uh, he had cleansed the temple, and you remember how they were upset his, by his behavior. Notice these words from Ellen White. Even from that time, the Jewish rulers wanted to kill Jesus. First of all, it tells the story of his cleansing the temple. Then she said, Jim? Quoting John, 2, 18 to 20. In these words, his meaning was twofold. He now let's just be clear about those words. He said, you know, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So he's talking about two things here, possibly. Go ahead. He referred not only to the destruction of the Jewish temple and worship, but to his own death, the destruction of the temple of his body. This the Jews were already plotting. As the priests and rulers returned to the temple, they proposed to kill Jesus and thus rid themselves of the troubler. Yet when he set them, excuse me, yet when he set before them their purpose, they did not understand him. You think they really didn't understand him? They refused to even think that he might be right. They took his words as applying only to the temple of Jerusalem and with indignation explained, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and, the, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Excuse me. Yeah, rear it up in three days. Now they felt that Jesus had justified their unbelief, and they were confirmed in their rejection of him. You know, to this day, uh, they don't really take that prophecy uh, to heart or what Jesus told, that it would, nothing would be left even a stone upon a stone. Yeah. You can't... It, Unfortunately, they refer to what Temple Mount, which was Fort Antonia at that time. It was not, that was not where the temple was. Temple was down to the south in uh, the area called uh, uh, City of David. Oh, no, the temple was between the Antonia Fortress and the City of David. Well, it's, it, was still, it was still to the south of Fort Antonia. Yeah. Antonia is what they call, now called uh, Temple Mount. So how could we so-called religious leaders become so upset at the behavior of someone like Jesus? I mean, here's someone that's doing marvelous works. People know that. They gather around, they want to listen to him. And they want to kill him because he cleansed the temple, because he performed a miracle? Wow. They chose to completely ignore the fabulous and wonderful miracle that Jesus had performed by healing that cripple. As they could think about this, all they could think about was the fact that Jesus had broken one of their rules, and this might be a chance for them to accuse him. So what should the Sabbath be for, and what should our attitude be as we keep the Sabbath? Remember Isaiah 53, 
I'm sorry, 58, 12 to 14. Isaiah 58, 2 to 14. You people will rebuild what has long been in ruins, building again on the old foundations. You will be known as the people who rebuilt the walls, who restored their ruined houses. The Lord says, if you treat the Sabbath as sacred and do not pursue your own interests on that day, if you value my holy day and, on, and honor it by not traveling, working, or talking idly on that day, then you'll find your joy that comes from serving me. I will make you honored all over the world, and you will enjoy the land I gave to your ancestor, Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. God is not asking for ritualistic, empty worship. He wants us to enter in a worship fully and completely with joy and delight. Moreover, God wants us to use the Sabbath as an opportunity to reach out to the hungry, the naked, those walking in darkness, those who need to keep, I'm sorry, those who need to know about the Savior. What is the purpose of a sign? Back in the days before we had cell phones to guide us to where we needed to go, signs were very important. We would look at the map and we would say, yeah, okay, and oh, oh there, there, there's that sign, there's that sign, and we would find our way most of the time. Some of us were a lot better at maps than others. But we'd find, find our way and we, would needed, we needed to go by reading the signs and then looking on the maps. Well, during World War II, according to the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, for Thursday, September 2, it says, During World War II, England was expecting an imminent invasion by the German army. Preparations were made to defend the island home such as much as possible. Extra fortifications were installed along the beaches. Roads, of course, would offer the enemy the fastest routes to their objectives, and consequently blockades were installed at strategic points. English authorities then did something strange. In order to slow down and confuse the enemy, railway signs were removed, road signs were taken down, and engraved markers on stone or on buildings couldn't be taken down, but they were covered with cement. Wow. <laughs> so please don't help anybody find their way, right? Not if it's the enemy. Yeah. The enemy's army. Yeah. So in what sense is the Sabbath a sign? From Exodus 31, 12 to 18, Good News Bible. The Lord commanded Moses to say to the people of Israel, keep the Sabbath, my day of rest, because it is a sign between you and me for all time to come, to show that I, the Lord, have made you my own people. You must keep the day of rest because it is sacred. Whoever does not keep it but works on that day is to be put to death. Wow. <clears throat> this is pretty serious stuff. Yeah. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a solemn day of rest dedicated to me. Whoever does any work on that day is to be put to death. So it says it again. So let me just interrupt there for a second. If you look carefully through the books of Moses, starting with, with Exodus, through to Deuteronomy, you will find that there's a death sentence for every, the breaking every one of the Ten Commandments except number 10. And why would it not be a death penalty for number 10? Because I can't tell what you're thinking, what you're coveting in your yeah. mind. I can, only, I can only define it if you actually take something yes. or kill someone or yep. et cetera. So you, you can't actually <laughs> accuse somebody and prove that they, they were coveting. So that's the only reason, as, as far as we can tell, that that, that, that commandment doesn't have a, a death uh, sentence connected to it. Continuing in Exodus 31, now 15. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a solemn day of rest dedicated to me. Whoever does any work on that day is to be put to death. The people of Israel are to keep this day as a sign of the covenant. It is a permanent sign between the people of Israel and me. 
because I, the Lord, made heaven and earth in six days, and on the seventh day I stopped working and rested. When God had finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets on, on which God himself had written the commandments. So that sounds an awful lot like the Sabbath commandment, but uh, with some variations. Yeah. A sign should point to something important that we need to know. The Sabbath is intended to provide opportunities for us to get to know God better. Earthly signs posted on roads and buildings require us to look for them. You could charge down the road and never bother to look at a sign. It won't help you. Signs won't do you any good. But God's sign comes once a week, whether we are ready or not, right on time. Some people reading Exodus 31 use that passage to suggest that the Sabbath was meant only for Israel and the descendants of Abraham. But we need to remember that what it says in Galatians 3, 28 and 29 about that question. Galatians 3. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Whoa. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about the background of the writing of the book of Galatians, this was a huge battle with the people who were trying to say, you have to be fully Jewish, you have to follow all the rules, you have to do everything just right, and then you can get circumcised, and then you can be a Christian. As long as you're male. Yes. And, and not a slave. And not a slave. So, um, Paul had a few things to say about that, didn't he? We do not have any way of stopping the days of the week. We cannot prevent the Sabbath from coming back each week. So the Sabbath serves as a constant reminder of God's plan for us. Jim? All through the week, we are to have the Sabbath in mind and be making preparation to keep it according to the commandment. We are not merely to observe the Sabbath as a legal matter. Ellen White, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 6, page 53, 253, excuse me, 353, sorry. Okay, let's, let's look at the thing about that for a moment. Do you think God holds people responsible for keeping the Sabbath if they've never ever heard about the Sabbath? No. No, he, I'm sure he doesn't. So this is for people who are aware of the Sabbath and all of its implications. What are the implications of the Sabbath? If you keep the Sabbath, what are you saying to people who are watching you? Ever asked yourself that? It might depend on the way you've conducted yourself in other ways. Yeah, yeah well, sure. Yeah. But let's assume that you have the right motives and you're keeping it correctly. I'm wanting to be in line with God. I'm okay. wanting to do what He wants me to do. I recognize that He is my Creator. Yeah. I'm worshiping on the day that celebrates what He has done. I recognize that He is my Redeemer. I'm, I'm celebrating on the day that he rested in the grave uh, because of his, his part of his sacrifice. Well, all heaven is keeping the Sabbath, but not in the listless, do-nothing way. On this day, every energy of the soul should be awake, for we are not to meet with God and with Christ our for are we not to meet with God and with Christ our Savior? We may behold him by faith, he is longing to refresh and bless every soul. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 362. And Charles, I'm going to ask you to read the next one. The demands upon God are even greater upon the Sabbath than upon other days. Does that mean God works harder on the Sabbath? Sounds like it. Oh dear. Says. Yeah, He's not following Jesus the rules? Jesus is saying, my, God, my father and I are at work. Mm -hmm. His people then leave their usual employment and spend the time in meditation and worship. They ask more favors of him on the Sabbath than upon other days. They demand his special attention. They crave his closest, choicest blessings. God does not wait for the Sabbath to pass before He grants these requests. Heaven's work never ceases, 
and men should never rest from doing good. The Sabbath is not intended to be a period of useless inactivity. The law forbids secular labor on the rest day of the Lord. The toil that gains uh, livelihood must cease. No labor for worldly pleasure or profit is used lawful upon that day. But as God ceased his labor of creating and rested upon this Sabbath and blessed it, so man is to leave the occupations of his daily life and devote these sacred hours to helpful rest, to worship, and to holy deeds, to holy deeds. The work of Christ in healing the sick was in perfect accord with the law. In honor, it honored the Sabbath. Okay, Desire of Ages, page 207. Here's a question for you. If your work all week long is studying and researching and whatever, the Bible, you're doing a PhD program in theology, let's say, you have to set the Bible aside on Sabbath in order to rest? Or if you're a minister and studying the scriptures all day, all week long, preparing a sermon and so on? Well, you have to give the sermon on Sabbath, so you can't leave it alone completely, can you? If you, if you call the, I love this. Um, if, you, if you call this, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if you call the Sabbath a delight, mm -hmm. The, whole, the Lord's holy, the honorable, I think that's the crux of it all. Yeah. It that's has Isaiah to be 58. That yep. is Isaiah 14. 58. Yes. Yep, exactly. Environmental issues, including global warming and the accumulation of trash in the oceans, have become very popular, very important political issues. People have taken very different approaches to these political agendas. So how should we, as the Adventists feel, if God made us in charge of the rest of the world, back in the days of Adam and Eve, shouldn't we still be doing everything we can to protect and preserve our environment? Shouldn't the Sabbath remind us that God has given us life and health and an environment in which we can learn about Him? I, uh, and I'm sure you all had these kinds of experiences as well. I drive, drive to work and drive home. And it's amazing, you know, all the junk you find along. And today on my way home, I just watched, just pitched a bunch of stuff right out of the window, big old truck, you know, he's driving along, whoop, you know, right in front of me, you know, and you, well, you know, okay. But it, it just, it's not, it doesn't seem right. It okay. wasn't $20 bills, was it? <laughs> no, I might have stopped if it was $20 bills. <laughs> Human beings are separate from all other creatures on this earth by the fact that they can think forward, they can plan ahead, or they can look back to in history and time. It has been said, quote, if we don't learn from history, we are condemned to repeat it. So remembering is a very important part of our lives. And what has God asked us to remember? The seventh day Sabbath. Think how serious things would be if we didn't have the capacity to remember. Everything that we needed each day would be lost. Um, I remember one of my, I can't even remember which teacher it was, taking us about how the, the brain works, and, and I should let Gordon talk about this, this is his field. Your brain every day has a certain amount of capacity to take on new things and think of new ideas and so forth like this. And suppose that every day you had to learn everything brand new. By the time you had brushed your teeth in the morning, you'd, all your you know, reserves for that day would probably be gone. If you could remember that you were to brush your teeth. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so why do we suppose that fourth commandment is the only commandment that begins with the word remember? Shouldn't we remember all the others? What are the things that God specifically wants us to remember each Sabbath? Surely he intends for us to think about creation and about redemption. And what he, he did for us in his, in his life and his death here on this earth. And each of these major events in history are connected in one way or another with the seventh-day Sabbath. In 2000, uh, okay? 
Maybe Gordon should read that one. Yeah. In 2008? In 2008, there was a fascinating article published titled, Neurotheology, Are We Hardwired for God? The article quotes Dean Hammer, a PhD behavioral geneticist. The author of the article, Rene Mueller, PhD, states, quote, <clears throat> in 2004, Hammer published The God Gene, How Faith is Hardwired into Our Genes, which was showcased in a Time cover story on neurotheology. Okay, so um, would you like to give us a definition of neurotheology? Well, <laughs> I, do, I am not an expert in neurotheology, but it would <laughs> obviously be the connection of theology and the brain. Yeah. Hammer made it clear that he had approached his work with the tools of natural science. The first task for any scientist attempted to link, link genetics to spirituality is to show that spirituality can be defined and quantified. Hammer's work is not about demonstrating the existence of God, which is the domain of religion, but about showing that spirituality is a real phenomenon that can be described and measured. Religion, he believes, is rooted in nurture and spirituality in nature. So the nurture okay. versus nature issue. Yeah. Okay, so do you know what part of the brain is involved with neurotheology? The frontal lobes. The frontal lobes, frontal lobes. okay. That's the part where we do our thinking. That's thinking and our reasoning and our decisions are made there. Yep. And what is most affected by Alcohol drugs, and drugs and alcohol and so on and things is the front part. The so really, what is a person? It's a pretty small part of you, isn't it? It's just even uh, smaller in some of us than others. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's less than the size of your fist is is, is really what what a person is. What does Not, it say? As he as a person thinketh, so is he. Is that the way yeah, the text goes? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> cognito ergo sum. In Latin, um, for those of you who are from, who know how to use a computer and are, are, avail, are able to get onto the internet, you can get our handouts. We have things we've been using here and talking about, uh, and on there there will be a link that you can go and read this article as if you choose to do so. Is it possible that even right inside our brains, God is placed in the genetic, genetic code at the deepest level our need for worshiping someone? Mm. And the Sabbath, better than any other gift, helps to fill that void. So what should we as Seventh-day Adventist Church be doing about pollution? Toxic pollution affects more than 200 million people worldwide, according to Pure Earth, a nonprofit environmental organization. Americas generate 30 billion foam cups, 220 million tires, and 1.8 billion disposable diapers every year, according to the Green Schools Alliance. Pollution in China can change weather patterns in the United States. And, uh, well, I mean, I so many things we could say about that. It takes just five days for the jet stream to carry heavy air pollution from China to the United States. And we, we learned a number of years ago when we were living in Africa that fires that were burning the, the jungle in the Amazon were causing droughts in Africa. About seven million premature deaths annually are linked to air pollution. According to the World Health Organization, that is one of in, one in eight deaths world, worldwide. Wow. The Sabbath is a clarion call to care for God's creation. So should we be out there in the streets uh, campaigning? What should we do? Well, at least we could avoid our share of the pollution, right? not throw things out of the window when we're driving along? Well, in, I cannot help it. We have only two minutes. Um, Lordy to see, in Lordy to see, the Pope now call for one day in a week rest. But wow. It's going to be Sunday, but he wants all over the world to pass. And it's coming. It's not too far. 
Think of the incredible things that God created just to make the Garden of Eden ready for Adam and Eve. There must have been fruit trees with beautiful fruit hanging ready for the eating. We do not know exactly what their diet consisted of, but we hope to find out one day. I certainly hope to. And our, I mean, uh, anyway, I could expound on all the wonderful fruits that we've experienced in the tropics and elsewhere. In any case, God has the ability to create whatever is needed. Just as he created the fruit on the trees in the Garden of Eden, he has power to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives if we allow him. We, he can breathe new life into our lives. That is what is supposed to happen in the process of baptism. The Sabbath was intended to be for the benefit of everyone. The story in John 5 about the paralytic man that was healed, in, he was healed and told to carry his mat is a very interesting one. Think of all the ways that Jesus could have avoided creating that conflict with the Jewish leaders if he had chosen to do so. He could have told the man just to leave the mat behind. He could have guided the man to go somewhere where he would not meet any of the Jewish leaders who would accuse him. He could have healed the man on some other day besides the Sabbath. Did Jesus intentionally do that on the Sabbath and ask the man to carry his mat so that he could create a conflict with the Jewish leaders? Hmm. The King James Version calls that pool the Pool of Bethesda. Bethesda means the House of Mercy or, or House of Grace. But archaeological evidence from that part of Jerusalem has revealed that that area next to the temple was actually called Bethzatha, the area of grapes. I'm sorry, the area of, uh, of olives. It is quite likely that the pool was not called the Pool of Bethesda, but rather named after that particular section of Jerusalem, Bethzatha, which means the House of Olives. Thus, more modern translations will suggest that the pool was named the Pool of Bethzatha. It was located very close to the Temple Mount. So some of you may wonder why your version reads a little differently. Um, Ellen White talks about how he came, Jesus came along and saw that one man, as, as bad as he was, he just, he, his, his sympathy went out to his compassion, he had to do something. And what are we doing? Do we feel sympathy and, and passion for the compassion for those who need it? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, once again we see the rationale for one of the many things that you have done for our benefit. Do we really experience the Sabbath as a huge benefit each week? Do we realize how much we need the rest that is supposed to be brought to us mm -hmm. by the Sabbath? We thank you for this chance to study that issue once again. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.